by 1917, the First World War had been raging for three years. On the morning of December 6th, though, it would feel as if the battle had been brought right to Canada's port town of Halifax, with an explosion that was said to be nearly apocalyptic and caused an extraordinary loss of lives and property damage within the millions of dollars. This bustling port was the center of wartime shipping for Canada. Its rail and shipping lines were being utilized for the nation's war effort. At the time, Halifax was mainland North America's deepest ice-free harbor and the closest large port to Europe. Allied and neutral countries alike used this particular port for moving troops to and from the battlefields of Europe, as well as shipping convoys of food, munitions, and other supplies. Armed warships were used as escorts for these convoys. It became Canada's main military port, Thousands of troops left from its deep water terminals for the unknown horrors of war in Europe. Halifax Harbor is also known as the Narrows because of its bottleneck inlet. The indigenous people, the Mi Kama, refer to this place as Kepe Kek, at Narrows or the Narrows. In 1749, British military and settlers took over a small portion of Mi Kama Key and named it Halifax which comprises much of northeastern North America. On this chilly winter's morning, nearly 104 years ago, the port was business as usual, with people going to and from the factories, rail lines, trail depots, schools, businesses, and homes, located all along both sides of Halifax Harbor. At 9.04 a.m., a horrendous explosion would blast through the crisp air to ravage the port and changed the lives and look of Halifax for a long time to come. Two huge steamships and one very narrow channel. The SS Emo, a Norwegian ship under charter to the Belgian Relief Commission, piloted by William Hayes, was on its way out of the harbor, heading to New York to pick up relief supplies for Belgium. Meanwhile, the SS Mont Blanc, a French ship laden with explosives, piloted by Francis Mackey, was coming into the harbor to join an outbound convoy. Inbound ships had the right of way over outgoing vessels because of the narrowness of the passage. Outgoing vessels normally depart towards the western side of the channel, the Halifax side, but the Emo was leaving the harbor on the eastern Dartmouth side. The way the Emo was sailing would have required incoming ships to pass by its right side, starboard, rather than its left side, port, which was the norm. In other words, the Emo was sailing too far to the east, on the wrong side of the Narrows. At this time, in 1917, there was no protocol for the safe passage of munition ships in the harbor, and even though the Mont Blanc had been cleared for passage through the channel by harbor authorities, other seagoing vessels were not warned or told to stay at their positions until the dangerous cargo had made it safely through and into the harbor. The Mont Blanc also carried no identifying flags or special markings to let others know the explosives held in her holds. About 2,925 metric tons of explosives. This included 62 metric tons of gun cotton, 246 metric tons of benzol, 250 metric tons of TNT, and over 2,000 metric tons of picric acid. Essentially, it was a whole floating arsenal. The Emo, being off course and too far to the east, was directly in the Mont Blanc's path. The two massive steamships attempted to make emergency maneuvers, but after several miscommunications, the ships collided, with the Emo impacting the starboard bow of the Mont Blanc and tearing a gash in its iron hull. This caused the 20-plus barrels of precariously stored petrol chemical on its upper deck to topple over and the explosive materials below to undergo a violent chemical reaction. The gash itself also generated sparks needed to ignite the volatile grains of dry picric acid stored below. It was not a fatal blow and would have otherwise been considered a minor fender bender in marine terms, if not for the character of the cargo the Mont Blanc was transporting. 
Because of this, the Mont Blanc was immediately transformed into a 3,000-ton bomb. Upon colliding, a fire broke out aboard the Mont Blanc. With the knowledge of what they were carrying in their holds, the crew immediately abandoned ship, swimming and rowing their boats furiously to shore, shouting warnings to all they passed. But they were shouting in French, a language which very few people in Halifax spoke at the time. Except for the pilot and crew of the Mont Blanc, there were very few naval officers and harbor officials aware of the escalating danger the Narrows were in. Teams of firefighters and sailors from other ships headed towards the burning vessel, while more and more people ran towards the waterfront to see what was going on. The crew of the email watched the spectacle from their own damaged ship. Vincent Coleman, a railway dispatcher who controlled the busy freight and passenger rail traffic coming and going from Halifax, and Chief Clerk William Lovett recognized what was happening and tried to send out a warning to all inbound trains to stay out and not travel to Halifax. Coleman stayed at his post, tapping out a telegraph with warnings, stating, Munition ship on fire, making for Pier 6. Goodbye. Coleman and Lovett were both killed in the explosion. The message Coleman sent in the last moments of his life was among the earliest received by the outside world about the disaster in Halifax. The fire that broke out on the Mont Blanc burned for up to 20 minutes while it slowly drifted into Pier 6. The collision and ensuing fire attracted an even bigger crowd of spectators that grew rapidly. At 9.04 a.m., the Mont Blanc finally exploded. The extreme amount of energy released ripped through the ship at thousands of meters per second. The gases that were emitted upon exploding created a massive wave of heat and pressure that was expelled in all directions. The blast pushed superheated air, water, and debris at a great speed into the heavily populated port area, neighborhoods, and businesses on both sides of the Halifax Narrows. The huge iron hull of the Mont Blanc disappeared, tearing a hole in the harbor bottom and sending shards of shrapnel into neighborhoods miles away from the harbor. The shaft of the ship's anchor, weighing 1,140 pounds, was blasted 2.5 kilometers away. The Mont Blanc's cannon landed almost 3 kilometers from the blast. The intensity of the explosion and shockwave, in turn, caused an 8-meter tidal wave that violently swept over the Halifax and Dartmouth shores. The tsunami surged to 18 meters above the high water mark and pushed inland almost three city blocks. The wave heaved the emo towards the shore, where it then became grounded. The captain, pilot, and its entire crew were lost. The explosion itself flattened more than 2.5 square kilometers of the city of Halifax. The Richmond and Turtle Grove neighborhoods received the majority of damages and loss of life due to their proximity to the initial blast. Almost 10,000 people were injured and nearly 2,000 lost their lives that day. One third of those were said to be children under the age of 15. About 12% of the population was lost by the exploding ship and the blast after effects like collapsing buildings and raging fires brought on by buildings falling on wood-burning stoves. Many of the people who survived were severely burned, had limbs missing, partial or full loss of sight, or had to have their eyes removed altogether due to the carbon raining down, smoldering shrapnel, and flying glass. Around 1,600 people lost their lives instantly. Roughly 400 more perished from their grievous injuries in the days that followed. Morgue records from 1918 show 1,631 known to be dead or missing. By 2004, the number had been revised at 1,946. The Mont Blanc may have been obliterated, but its crew only suffered a single fatality, which occurred from falling debris. To make matters worse, the fire chief Edward Condon had been killed while rushing to assist, and the city's only fire pumper truck had been destroyed. Charles Mayers, a survivor working as third officer on the vessel Middleham Castle, was picked up and thrown nearly one kilometer from his ship. He landed atop Needleham Hill in Richmond. Mayers was quoted as saying, I was wet when I came down. I had no clothes when I came to, except my boots. 
An additional 25,000 people were made homeless or lacked proper shelter after the explosion. As reported by Gratan O'Leary in the aftermath, some of the smaller homes not only collapsed, they were simply blown away. Three kilometers of desert was created in the twinkling of an eye. A situation exacerbated by the winter blizzard that struck Halifax the very next day. Luckily, the port was able to take advantage of the legions of well-disciplined military personnel who just happened to be in the city, providing a ready and organized workforce to bring immediate aid and some semblance of order. The explosion made headlines around the world, and it was the first time the Canadian Red Cross had desisted in disaster relief efforts. Massachusetts dispatched a trainload of doctors, nurses, and medical supplies to help as well. Aid streamed in from around the world, and transatlantic naval convoys were able to resume within a week's time. On February 4, 1918, Arthur Drysdale, the Nova Scotia judge presiding over the inquiry into the tragic disaster, found the Mont Blanc solely at fault for the explosion, although they had the right of way into the harbor and through the channel at the time. Then, in 1919, the inquiry's conclusions were appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada, which declared that both the Mont Blanc and Emo were equally at fault. In the end, though, no one was ever successfully prosecuted for any failures leading to the explosion. The city healed and rebuilt, but they'd never forgotten this avoidable tragedy. This was one of the largest human-made explosions prior to the detonation of the first atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima in 1945. Because of this epically tragic and deadly event, stricter maritime laws regarding cargo identification and harbor traffic control were enacted. Frank Baker, a Royal Navy sailor who was pulling wartime duty as a ship inspector in the harbor of Halifax, wrote the only known written eyewitness account on the day of the explosion. In his diary, he gave a grave account of the events, with grim detail and sadness. He wrote that he and several other Royal Navy personnel tried to run and assist the ship, but saw it would be futile at that point. As stated in his diary, we had to return to our ship as quickly as possible. We're a guard ship, and we're responsible for the safety of other vessels in the harbor. After the First World War, his son inherited his diary, and it sat unread for decades in his son's garage until after his death. It's now included in an exhibit on the explosion's centennial at the Dartmouth Heritage Museum, where it will be on display for the foreseeable future. Now, more than 100 years later, the hands on the Town Hall clock tower remain forever broken at 9.05. Later seismic studies would place the exact time of the blast at 9.04.35. Not even the city's tree canopy went unscathed. Debris and shards of identified flying objects were lodged into the trunks and branches of trees for miles. A half-ton chunk of the Mont Blanc's anchor still lies exactly where it was blown. Even now, the trees in Halifax are notoriously impure, and no one will purchase lumber from there in fear of destroying their expensive machinery on 100-year-old iron shards. As one arborist stated after his chainsaw began sparking when trying to cut a massive silver maple, the entire core of the trunk was just a column of metal shards. To this day, the great Christmas tree in Boston Commons in Boston, Massachusetts sits donated by Nova Scotia as a gesture of thanks for their help and friendship during the disaster. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. This is a new project I'm trying where I cover dark events in history, disasters, things like that. Uh, mostly I'm going to try to cover stuff that I think not a lot of people have heard before because I think it needs to be talked about more. And I'll try to do my best to cover it with as much information as I am able to find myself. I also like to include the aftermath of what happened and if anything changed as a result. Let me know how you guys felt about this first video. Despite the Halifax disaster being one of the worst maritime disasters in all of history, and also being the biggest man-made explosion before the atomic bombs dropped, not a lot of people seem to talk about it, so... I thought I'd give it a try and do my best to bring it justice. If you guys appreciated the content in this video, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe, but only if you feel so inclined. 
I'd like to give a special thanks to Toxic Queen who assisted in writing this script with me after I compiled all the research and evidence together. I would also like to give a special thanks to my video editor. You will find a link to his social media in the description below. You will also find a link to my social media in case you want me to cover any particular event that's happened in history that you don't think a lot of people talk about normally. I'll try to give it a shot and do my best to do it justice. If you guys are curious about the music used in this video, it will be listed in the description. I will also list all of my sources, so if you would like to read onward on your own and discover more about the event, that will be available to you. If you guys like other kinds of dark, horror, scary content kind of stuff, I also have a channel called Blue Spooky where I read true scary stories and do documentary videos on mysteries and things like that. And then I also have a true crime channel called Mr. Blue Skies, which you can check out if you'd like that kind of thing as well. I think that's all for now though guys, so thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great and safe day.